chapter 29 this evening. Um, tonight I'm going to attempt to do something that I very rarely ever do here at Calvary Phelan, and that is we're going to cover two chapters tonight. I know, I know, I know. I've been thinking about this as I was covering this portion and going, I think it should be done. And so if you have a bookmark and you usually go to the end of what our text is going to be, put it at the end of chapter 30 because we will go all the way to chapter 30 tonight. I'm very confident <laughs> that we're going to do this. <laughs> uh, there's going to be a lot of reading, um, some commentary along the way. Um, hopefully I do it some justice and we'll take some breaks along the way. Um, again, just to kind of give you a, a feeling of the narrative, the storyline that's kind of going on, because there's so much that goes on in these two chapters. And, and I think it's very important for us to kind of cover these things. Um, if, if you were with us last time in our study, Jacob um, has been encouraged to leave the comforts of his home by his father um, to basically go and find a wife among his own people which would be about a 500-mile trek up north towards where his father or his grandfather had left. Now, he wasn't going all the way to Ur of the Chaldeans. He's going to Haran, which today we would look at in its modern-day Syria. So that's where he's headed to, but it's going to be a good little trek for him as he goes. The underlining reason, if you remember, for him having to leave his his home is because his twin brother Esau wants to kill him uh, because of the deception that has been taking place. Now, I thought it's kind of interesting in that whole scenario that we were looking at for the last couple of weeks in the fact that the reason he wants to kill him is because his mom devised this plan to deceive her husband about the whole blessing thing. Instead of waiting on the Lord, because again, it was going to happen one way or another, and yet she thought, well, let's devise this plan just in case. And, um, and so what we learned in that chapter, in that whole scenario, is that Isaac was the one that kind of got this whole ball going. He knew that he wasn't supposed to bless or give the blessing to Esau. It was supposed to go to Jacob. And he's the one that started it, but mom... <laughs> Mom is the one that devised a, another plan. And what is interesting is that all of them, all four of them were guilty. All of them, um, one way or another, they had their part in this, and they could have all stopped it at any time, and yet they didn't. But be that as it may, he is on a journey, Jacob is. And on this journey, I love the fact that, again, he, he's going, he has just deceived, it has been so faithless, that chapter, that in this chapter, he has an encounter with God. And I love the fact that even though he has been deceptive, even though he, is, uh, he has been conniving, so to speak, God is still faithful to encounter him. God didn't have to do that, but he does. And he did that. And in this encounter... His faith is now coming into view. It's not based, based on his grandfather's faith, Abraham, nor is it based on his father's faith. He now has his own relationship with the Lord because of this encounter. And, and so now it becomes his faith. And what we see from here on out, from this chapter onward, is that we see a different Jacob. And I believe that whenever we have an encounter with the Lord, in any way, shape, or form, we should not be the same as we were before that encounter. Something has, has, should have changed in our lives. And so let's read the first 14 verses, and we'll do some commentary, and then we'll move on. It says in verse, 20, verse 1 of chapter 29 of Genesis, So Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. And he looked and saw a well in the field. And behold, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well, they watered the flocks. A large stone was on the well's mouth. Now all the flocks would be gathered there and they would roll 
the stone from the mouth, the, the well's mouth, water the sheep and put the stone back in its place on the well's mouth. And Jacob said to them, my brethren, where are you from? And they said, we are from Haran. And he said to them, do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, we know him. So he said to them, is he well? And they said, he is well. And look, his daughter Rachel is coming with the sheep. Then, then he said, look, it is still high day. It is not time for the cattle to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go and feed them. But they said, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered together and they have rolled the stone from the well's mouth. Then we will water the sheep. Now, while he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's flock, for she was a shepherdess. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, um, and that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the, the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. And Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's relative and that he was Rebekah's son. So she ran and told her father. Then it came to pass when Laban heard the report about Jacob his sister's brother, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. So he told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, Surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him for a month. As I shared with you last time, this, this journey that he was going on, before he gets to Bethel, he, he, he had already traveled three days, got to Bethel, but he still had some 20 to 25 days to make it all the way up to Haran. So it, it was about a month of journeying. He had, he had left his father's house, and it doesn't tell us, and it hasn't told us anything about him traveling with a, with a, a caravan, with any other people. If, if you remember a while back when, when Abraham had sent his servant, he had sent all this stuff with them. It doesn't tell us anything of the sort here, and so he is making this trip by himself. Once again, we need to remember Jacob is about 77 years old at this point when he is making this trek. I think we often get the misconception that he leaves the house and he's this wayward teenager, maybe a little older, maybe in his early 20s, and he's making a life for himself. And, and, and we have that misconception that he is a young man, but he's not a young man. He is 77 years old. And the more I look at this, the more I think about this, when you were 77 years old back then, it was maybe like being 37 here, you know, because again, they had the vigor, they had they had the ability to do stuff because we're going to see that he becomes a very, very hard worker. We don't know how hard of a worker he was at home. I kind of have a feeling he had a comfortable life at home. But being 30, 77 years old, it's like you've kind of had to make a life for yourself somewhat. But he has, he's not been married yet, which I think is fascinating. And so he comes to the land. I, I'm not sure if somebody had given him a map. This is the directions you go. Um, to, to Haran, but I would like to think that it was the Lord that was directing his path. Especially after what happened in Bethel and that time that he had with the Lord, that he began to ask the Lord for direction and for, for guidance because it was that special time that he had with the Lord and the Lord had promised that he would be with him, that he would do all for him what he had promised to his grandfather. And so he has that going for him. But Jacob has now come to his grandfather Abraham's homeland. Again, it wasn't Ur of the Chaldeans, but if you remember, 
Abraham had left Ur and went up to Haran. It doesn't tell us how long he was in Haran, but that became his home for a while, and that's where his father had died. To this point, this chapter begins when he arrives there. It has been 354 years since Abraham was there. That's when he left. Over 300 years ago, when he had got this promise from God that God told him to leave that country. So t- some time has passed. The last time somebody from Abraham's family or, or company had been there is when Abraham had sent his servant up to that same area to find a bride for his his son, and that happened to be like 97 years earlier. So again, time just passed over there. So you can imagine him finally getting there because it never tells us that that Jacob had traveled anywhere. This is the first time he's traveling, and he's traveling all the way over there, and it's been quite almost 100 years since anybody from Abraham's family had been there, it seems like. And he saw a well. Sounds very similar to Abraham's servant when, when he came there, he went to where the, the people were, were gathered, and it was a well. And I always want to say, well, well, well. <laughs> because that was the best place to find people. If you were a stranger and you didn't know exactly where you were at, you knew if there was water somewhere. Or if you saw a group of people, you know that there's probably going to be water. And, and water was not like, like with us. You can just go you know, buy a case of water. You, know, you had to bring some water with you, but you had to find along the way good water and water where, where it could sustain you. And so when they saw a group of people, especially shepherds, they thought, this is a good place to go find out where exactly am I right now? Because I'm traveling, I'm supposed to be going that way, and I've been going that way. I just want to make sure I'm, 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 I'm headed in the right direction. And so he gets to this place, and he asks the people about, about where he's at. <laughs> Am I where I'm supposed to be? And again, he came to the place where he was supposed to be. Because I, I truly, again, believe that the Lord was directing him. Again, water was a very, like it is today, a very important commodity. (laughs) And the shepherds waited until all of the the flocks would be gathered together before they would open up this well. It tells us about this rock, about this stone. However big it was, it probably took one or two people to really move it because it was a large stone. And mainly the reason they would cover it up is so that when somebody was not taking care of it, critters didn't just fall in and then die in there and then pollute and, and, and ruin the water, poison the water, if you will. And so they always covered it. And it's interesting because they're all gathered there. They could have opened it up and just kind of kept watching. It's like, no, 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 no. We got to wait until everybody's here. I, I think it's kind of interesting that he gets there. And again, he finds out who they are. But, but in verse 7, I think it is, uh, he starts telling them how to do things. And don't you just love it when a foreigner comes to your house and tells you how you should be doing it? Uh, I, I think Americans are notorious for that. When we go to another country, it's like, well, that's not the way we do it over there. And they're going, I don't care how you do it over there. <laughs> and, and I think a, a lot of times, especially in the missionary community, to go somewhere and start trying to change everything when you're in their country. And it's like, I've learned throughout the years, that's not our job. We, 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 we want to do what they do <laughs> and how they do it. But anyways, he gets there and he, asks, he, he calls them brethren, which was a normal greeting. And, and uh, he wants to find out if he's, if he's even close. And sure enough, he is. And he asks them, do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And, and it's interesting because I don't know the tone here. Because as we're going to get to know Laban... It's quite possible, like, yes, we know Laban. Because they don't go like, oh, you're looking for Laban. Oh, my gosh, Laban. Oh, my God, we love Laban. You you, you don't hear any of that. Yeah, we know who he is. So perhaps his his famous preceded him. And he says, is he well? And they said, well, well, well. But (laughs) 
But they say, yes, he is well. Oh, and by the way, here comes his daughter. So it's almost like the fact that, that they don't offer a lot of information. They're probably glad. Here comes his daughter. You can talk to her. Let's move on. And it says that he looks and he saw the daughter. He looked at the daughter. And I don't know how far away she was. And I don't know how old she was. But he looked at her and he's like, hmm. Now, he understands this is family. But that's what he's there for. He is there to find a wife. And so she's the first one that comes up. Now, I, again, when he starts telling these guys in verse 7, it's still high day. You guys should be out, make sure you guys go do whatever. It's almost like he wants to have her there by himself and kind of getting rid of the other shepherds. And they're saying, oh, no, that's not how we do it here. When we come together, we wait until everybody gets here. And then we open it up. And then we feed our flocks. And then we close it up. And so however it was, I love the fact that he... He, he, he understands what they're going to do. And while he was speaking, she comes and, and, and she presents herself. And it came to pass, it says in verse 10, when Jacob saw her, that she was the daughter of his mother's brother, his uncle, that he went and rolled the stone away. I'm thinking, what are you trying to show off there, buddy? Because that's kind of what it looks like. But he ends up doing something for her and saying, let me water the sheep. I don't know how big the flock was, but he is now laboring to make sure that, that the, the, the flock is taken care of. And so, so while, while she's there, he ends up introducing himself and telling her who she is or who he is. And it says that Jacob kissed her. Now, this wasn't like an American kiss that somebody would kiss. This is, this is a custom back then. He knew that they were relatives, and so it was probably a cheek-to-cheek -cheek kind of kiss. And I love the fact that even in that, he lifts up his voice and he weeps because he, he got to the place where he knew he was supposed to be because that's what the plan was. As he obeyed his father to go find a wife, he has found somebody from his family. Now, it kind of looks like it's love at first sight for him because all of a sudden, I think in that, I don't think he meant anything by that, but I think he was attracted to her because of what, how we're going to read a little later. And so when he reveals to her, not only am I your cousin because your, your dad and my mom are brother and sister, my father is also related to you. And so now he takes it all the way back to Abraham, which would have been her grandfather as well. And, and, and so now we have this, this relationship here. And, and so it says that once they have that going on, that she runs and tells her father. It was 97 years earlier that we, we read about Laban when Isaac came knocking at the door. Well, not Isaac, but the servant. And so you can imagine when she goes and tells her dad, hey, somebody from Isaac's family, Jacob is here. You know that this guy, because of what happened last time, he's thinking cha-ching. This guy probably came with an entourage like his father did, with, with, or, or they sent all this goodies, all this stuff, camel loads of stuff, as a dowry. And so Laban being who he is, he's probably thinking that. And so it came to pass that Laban, when he heard the report, he ran to meet him. And when he embraced him, he kissed him again, which was custom. And he brought him to his, his house. And Jacob began to tell him why he is there. And Laban invites him into his home and he says that he is now bone my bone and my flesh which some commentators thought it, it, it's almost like i will adopt you into my home you, this is now your home as long as you want to be with us this is your home and it tells us that he stayed with them for a month now i don't think as we're going to read i don't think that that lay, uh, that jacob gets there and just becomes a bum 
I think that in that month, he was pushing his weight. He was pulling his weight, I, I, I should say. That he began to do what he was supposed to do and take care of whatever needed to be done. And it is at that moment that, that all of a sudden, Laban begins to see something in Jacob. And so in verse 15 to verse 30, Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what should your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder, the older, uh, the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were delicate, but Rachel was beautiful from, in, of form and appearance. Now Jacob loved Rachel. So he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your youngest daughter. And Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than I should give her to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel. And they seemed only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go into her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Jacob. And he went into her. And Laban gave his, his maid, Zilpah, to his daughter, Leah, as a maid. So it came to pass in the morning that, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, What is this that you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? And Laban said, it must not be done so in, my, in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Fulfill her week, and we will give you this one also for the service which you will serve with me still another seven years. Then Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. So he gave her his daughter, Rachel, to be as his wife. And Laban gave his maid, Bilhah, to his daughter, Rachel, as a maid. Then Jacob also went in to Rachel, and so he loved Rachel more than Leah. And he served with Laban another seven years. So as he is, has invited him into his home, as he's basically adopted him because he is family, and it gives us the impression that because he was not a lazy bum, that he did what he was supposed to do and take care of what he was supposed to take care of at Laban's property, that Laban noticed that this guy is a hard worker. And I'm sure his, his thinking is, I better give him something or offer him something before somebody else sees that he's such a good worker and maybe draw him away. And so he hits him up and he says, tell me what your wages are that I may pay you, because it, it makes no sense that you would serve me for nothing. So I love the fact that what we're learning about Jacob is that he's actually a hard worker. We didn't know that about him before. And, and I don't know what has happened in his life back with his father, if he was a big help, but it seems like he is now. And so Laban is going, well, this guy didn't come with all the riches, <laughs> I'm sure he was very disappointed that he just didn't buy one of his daughters, give the dowry, and he could have took her. But he decides to offer him a position. And so it tells us that he had the two daughters, the older Leah and the younger Rachel. And it gives us a description of these two women. And when it says that Leah had had delicate eyes. I know that some people say, say well, she had some weak eyes. She, she wasn't as pretty. She, was, she could barely see. And, and so you start seeing and imagining all these things about her. But 
It doesn't help that her name means fatted cow. I'm kidding. It means gazelle. <laughs> it means gazelle. <laughs> she wasn't ugly. She just had different... It, it, one commentator said there was no sparkle in her eyes like her sister. Her, her, her sister, again, it was almost that love at first sight. When, when he sees her, he says, like, I want that one. And there's nothing wrong with, with that because the, the appearance, he really loved her. And there, there, there was something between them. But, but, but you almost feel bad for Leah because, again, people have always like, looked at her as less than. But just whatever it was with her eyes, it, there, there was no like gleam. But it says that, that he loved her. He loved Rachel. When he says, what's your wages? He says, I will work seven years for her. Now, that is quite an offer. Again, maybe months, maybe even a year to serve you for them because I have no money. It's interesting because his father is filthy rich. And I remember hearing a story about a basketball player, and they're talking about his, how rich he is and, and that his kids would always say, yeah, we're rich, and he would always say, no, I'm rich. You're not rich. <laughs> and that's basically this situation. <laughs> Because he didn't send him with anything. And so now he has to work for this. And he sells himself for seven years. And seven years is a long time. And so I'm sure Laban's going, man, if you're a hard worker, you're going to work for me seven years to take her? Can you imagine what Rachel is thinking? He is willing to give that much for me. Can you imagine how special she feels? That, that he would offer to work so much because normally it wouldn't be that long. And so when he says he really did love her, he really did because it tells us here that, that he, he said, well, I'd rather give her to you than anybody else. And, and, and I think verse 20 is one of the most, I don't know, one of those like, like verses you go, oh, because it says, and he served seven years for Rachel because it seemed only a few days to him because he loved her. You go, oh, oh, geez, man. But again, it went by fast because that's what kind of, when, when you're in love with somebody, it's like, oh, man, you just, think, things just happen. And, 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 and to him, it's like, I'll do it, I'll do it again. And he will have to. <laughs> basically, but but it says that Jacob, he says, I will do this for seven years, but I want you to give, give you my wife, or give you, give me your daughter. And I love the fact that he is like counting down the days, because in 21 he says, give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled. <laughs> it's like, I've been counting the days that I may take her to be my wife and know her, if you will. And so it says that they had this a, a, a feast. And it's interesting because the, the word feast in the Hebrew means more of a drinking party. So there was going to be a lot of, a lot of booze or whatever. That's what, what it means even in the Hebrew. And so people have been feasting. And it came to pass in the evening... And he took Leah, his daughter. And this is where we begin to see that Laban, Laban's a conniver. Again, when, when he offered to work so much for him, he's going, man, I got a maid here. Can't imagine somebody doing that for free. For my daughter, pff, no, no worries. And yet when it comes down to it, <clears throat> he takes his daughter, Leah. And you almost look at this and you go, how could he do this to his daughter? He knows that he loves the other one, that she is not loved by him. And yet he's going to do the old switcheroo, if you will, with her. And this is where you go, she must have been, they must have been not identical, but there must have not been a huge difference 
Now, I, I understand that in those days when they went into the, the honeymoon tent, it wasn't all lit up. It was, it was a dark time. And they didn't have all those things. But Jacob has been drinking. People have been drinking. And so he gives her to him. And, and so you could imagine what she must have felt knowing he really doesn't want me. He wants my sister. And yet, she understands what the custom is. But can you imagine, as the feast is going on, that Rachel's anticipating to go into her husband, what would be her husband, and they push her aside. It's like, no, your sister's going to go in there. And so you kind of just look at this whole situation and going, man, this is wrong. How, how could he do this? And yet, we almost have to go back to that story of how he deceived his father. And, and, and how, how he took advantage of the darkness of his father's eyes that he could not see. And he deceives his father. And here we have this dark moment that he is now being deceived. And, and, and so things are now coming around. And so, you know, we, we, we know the scripture that whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. And, and this, isn't not like, this isn't like this karma thing. This is just the principle in life that when we are doing certain things, more than likely we're going to have to reap the benefits of what we've done. And he is reaping that benefit right now that, that he is being tricked and deceived. And, and I don't know if he felt like in the morning, because I can, I can imagine in the morning when he found out that it's Leah, that he is livid about what's going on right now. It's not Leah's fault. But he is so upset that he goes and he confronts Laban. What is this that you have done to me? Rachel was the one that I served you for. Can you imagine for seven years, and again, part of me wants to go, Jacob, did you not ask about traditions? Did you not see what was going on in seven years? That Laban says, oh, it must not be so. That's not the way we do things here. The, older, the, the younger can't get married first. He's, he's known that for seven years. When he asked for Rachel, he thought, I'm going to give you Leah. He knew that for all this time. But I almost blame Jacob because he never really caught on to that. And so he says, fulfill her week. Let's just finish off this week. And at the end of the week, after you've spent your time with your bride and this whole feast is over, I will give you Rachel as well. And then you can serve me seven years after that. So he will end up serving him for 14 years for these two girls. And so they did so. And he gave him his da her daughter, his daughter. And, 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 and they get these two maids that will be integral, integral that will be used in, in this story as we go on. And so he served him. So verse 31. Then the Lord saw that Leah was unloved. He opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So Leah conceived and bore a son and called his name Reuben. For she said, the Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he has therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon conceived again and bore a son and said now this time my husband will become attached to me because I have bore him three sons therefore his name was called Levi and she conceived again and bore a son and said now I will praise the Lord therefore she called his name Judah then she stopped bearing it's funny how the lord 
<clears throat> sees this whole situation, knows what's exactly going on. And I don't think he's punishing Rachel as he is understanding the plight of, of who Leah is and how important Leah will be in this story. And the fact that she is not loved, but she is a wife for this man. <clears throat> and so the Lord begins to open her womb. Now Rachel's womb will be open later on. But at this moment it's not. And so now he has these two wives. And so Leah, and, and, and he's doing his husbandly duties on both ends. This is the ultimate in sister wives, if you will. <laughs> They are real sisters. And it's funny, I forgot what chapter it is, but in Leviticus it tells us that, that they shouldn't marry sisters because of the envy between sisters. Again, this is before Leviticus. And so she has Reuben, and the name Reuben means a son. And so to her, she's going, I have a son. This will change everything in our lives. Because this is what he wants. I'm sure he's told her about the covenant. I'm sure he's told her about what God will do with them, that he will bless them and multiply them. Having this one son is guarantee, if he doesn't die, that, that, that this line will continue. And so Reuben becomes very important because he is the firstborn. And she says, because he's seen my affliction... It's funny because even though the, the word Reuben means a son, it also means see. And so he sees what's going on. And perhaps now my husband will love me. And she conceives again. And it's funny because in these verses, she's, she conceives four different times. At least five years has gone by here in these verses. Because again, sometimes when we're reading, we're just going, oh, another one, another one, another one. But we, we end up kind of putting aside, how long is this taking? Nine months each pregnancy. I mean, probably back to back. And, and so she has the other son who, who is Simeon. And Simeon's name is Hearing. Because again, she is crying out. She is begging the Lord. She wants the attention of her husband, but she's not loved by her husband. And, and you almost want, can't, I, I, I want to say you can't, you can't blame Jacob because he never said he loved her. This was forced on him. He loved Rachel. But he's doing his husbandly duties with her and, and, and at least spending that time with her, but, but even through the second son. And she conceives again, and this time she has another son, and his name is Levi, which means joined or attached. So she's still hoping that there will be a connection that will eventually happen because now he has three sons. His, his grandfather had one son, basically, that was the promise. His father had two sons. And now we have three sons. <laughs> and she is hoping that this will solidify their relationship, and it doesn't happen, and she conceives again. And I love the fact that when she comes to this point, she names him Judah, and, and each one of these names has to do with the situation that she is in and the struggles that she is battling because she is unloved. And she gets to this point, she names him Judah, and the word Judah or the name Judah means praise. And it's almost she finally comes to the conclusion that I can't get anything from my husband and so my focus is now on you, God, and I will praise you for what you've done and you've blessed me. Now what I find fascinating about the end of this chapter is sir, there's four sons. There will be another, there will be 12 in all. How many is that? Eight, right? Eight more. They could stop right here and that will be all good because the Messiah comes from the tribe of Judah. They could have stopped right here. Everything could have stopped. And Levi would be the, the priestly line. So they have the priest and they have the, the line that will continue on to the Messiah. And so everything could stop right here and it would have been fine. We would have been talking about the four tribes of, of Israel, not the 12 tribes of Israel. Chapter 30. Now Rachel 
saw that she bore Jacob no children. Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, Give me children or else I die. And Jacob's anger was aroused against Rachel. And he said, Am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of your womb? So she said, Here is my maid, Bil Bilda, Bil Bilha. Go into her, and she will bear a child on my knees, <clears throat> that I also may have children by her. Then she gave him Bilha, his, her maid, as wife, and Jacob went in to her. And Bilha con conceived and bore Jacob a son. And Rachel said, God has judged my case. And he has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore she called his name Dan. And Rachel's maid Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. And Rachel said, With great wrestling I have wrestled with my sister, and indeed I have prevailed. So she called his name Naphtali. Then Leah saw that she had stopped bearing. She told Zilpah, her maid, and gave her, so she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her to Jacob as wife. And Leah's maid, Zilpah, bore Jacob a son. Then Leah said, a troop has come. So she called his name Gad. And Leah's maid, Zilpah, bore Jacob a second son. And Leah said, I am happy, for the daughters will call me blessed. So she called his name Asher. Rachel, the loved one, the one that he truly just was enamored with. She understands that she is not having any kids. Again, I don't know at what point in, in how many years has, has now passed that she's going, she's had two, she's had three, she has four. Because again, it, 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 the, the, the narrative takes us to where it seems like she had four and then she decided to complain. But it could have been at the first or second that she could have started complaining, I have no children, she's already starting to bear all these kids. So we don't know the time frame there, but it's quite possibly that it didn't take five years for her to start complaining. She probably started complaining right away. Because there was this envy between these two sisters. They're both having their time with their husband, but she is not getting pregnant, but she is. And it comes to a point where she, she asks her husband, she tells her husband, give me children or else I die. In other words, I will make life miserable for you because I will be miserable because I don't have no kids. <laughs> and Jacob... Again, you would say, bro, don't get mad. She's the one that you love. Why would you be upset at her? <laughs> but I love what he says. Am I in the place of God? And it's interesting because we look at this intimacy thing of having sex, and it's like, no, you created it. It's like, no, ultimately God does that. God's the one that, that, that's in control of all of that. He says, I, 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 do, I do what I'm supposed to do, but God is the one that's held this from you for whatever reason. And, and I think that in a situation like this, where, 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 again, it's not just being barren, but in other issues that, that wives, again, you, you, you could be so strong-headed and, and put your husband in a place of going, what do you want from me? <laughs> Because I could guarantee you, as being a man, most of us want to do as much as we can for you, but we are not God. <laughs> and we can't be your everything. And this is what's kind of happening in this situation that he's going, what do you want from me? What else can I do? And so she comes up with the idea, you know what? Here's my maid. 
I will have a child. And, and it was purely legal there in that time that if you could not conceive, because again, it was a stigma for them to be in that position. So I don't know how many years they've been in this position, but this is what's going on. That when she bore the child, it would go directly onto the mother. And the mother, again, it would come from her. Most times the maid wouldn't even touch the baby and hand it over. It would be handed over to, to the wait, expecting mother so that the bond would take place there. And so that's what happens. She has a son named Dan. And Dan means judging. In other words, okay, God, God is not judging me in the bad way anymore. He has given me what I need, a child. And then, and then she, she has another son, Nephtali, means wrestling. And, and I, you look here and you're going, man, this has been a thorn in her side because she, she's not wrestling with God as she's much wrestling with her sister and competing with her sister. And this is why, again, one wife is bad enough. I mean, good enough. <laughs> having two, having a, three or four is like way too many. Because yeah, it just doesn't work. And so Leah sees this is like, well, two can play that game. Here's Zilpa. Zilpa, go, go, get over there. I've always thought this about these chapters. Like, does anybody else see what's going on here? Jacob is having sex with four different women. Did anybody else catch that? It's like, and he's just like, what? All right, all right. And it's like, what the heck? <laughs> and it's like, it's interesting because we have these kids being born. You had four, and now you have five, six, seven, eight to verse 13. And then we move on in verse 14 to 24. He says, now Reuben went in those days. Now Reuben, again, he's the firstborn. He's probably somewhere about seven years old at this time. And Reuben went in the days of the wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. And Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? And Rachel said, therefore, he will lie with you tonight for your son's mandrakes. It's like, what is this? Okay. Then Jacob came out of the field in the evening. Leah went to him, met him to meet him and said, you must come into me. For I have surely hired you <laughs> with my son's mandrakes. And he laid with her that night. And the Lord listened to Leah. And she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. And Leah said, God has given me my wages because I have given my maid to my husband. So he called, so she called his name Issachar. And Leah conceived again and bore Jacob six sons, a sixth son. And Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment now my husband will dwell with me because I have bore him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. Zebulun. Afterwards, she bore a daughter and called her name Dinah. Then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb. And she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. So he, she called his name Joseph and said, The Lord has added, me, added to me another son. Now these mandrake things, they, they're called the love apples. Apparently they were used for fertility and or uh, an aphrodisiac type stuff for sensuality. Now, this is not what caused more babies to happen. It was a, something that they thought would, 
would conceive. But God's the one that's in this because, again, all of this is happening and God is listening to Leah. He's listening to Rachel. He's, he's involved in all of this. Again, you look at this and, and you're going, what kind of household is this? This is crazy. The fact that, that she has a son, his name is Issachar, and the meaning of Issachar is higher. Because she hired her husband to have a child with them. Can you imagine when somebody goes, Issachar? I've never met an Issachar before. How'd you get that name? Well, it's kind of a long story, but it's a crazy family. But my dad was hired out so I can have... Can you imagine? Poor kid. But then she has the sixth son, Zebulun, and means dwelling. And it almost seems like she is now at peace. She, she can just dwell knowing that she has had six sons. So out of the 12 sons, and here we have 11 sons. Six of them are from Leah, the unloved one. And again, here's when you start seeing that God, he has a way of doing things that, that she is unloved and she is the one that bears most of the children of Israel or the tribe of Israel. Two of them come from from one from Bilna and the other one from Zilpa. Two more from there. And, and here we have that Rachel finally has a child and names him Joseph, which means added or adding. And her prayer is that he would add another son to her. And that will come a little later in Benjamin. And so here we have the 12 tribes of Israel being born. This is where they come from. And what I've always thought is like, it's interesting because we look at the 12 tribes of Israel and they come from four different women. They come from Syrian women. These two women, these slaves, we don't know where they are. These, these, these maids, we don't know where they come from. But it is these people that make up the tribe of Israel, the children of Israel. God had chosen these people, and that's why Isaac wanted him to go up there so he would keep it within the family, but you have these maids that have come in. And so again, you're going, God has a way of putting things together and making them holy. Because we, we will see from here on out the 12 tribes of Israel. What is interesting is that when we look at the tribe, 12 tribes of Israel, when they're given the land, two of them that, that we see here, Benjamin will come later, Joseph and Levi are not mentioned when they, when they give the land. But we do have Manasseh and we do have Ephraim, which happen to be Joseph's sons. And so Levi doesn't get an inheritance because he comes a priestly area. And Joseph is usually not mentioned either because his two sons are adopted into that place. But we have the 12 tribes of Israel here from four different ladies. And Jacob, again, now his family begins to grow. Now, one daughter is mentioned here, and she's mentioned because she will be a part of another story. But I could almost guarantee you that in this time frame, there may have been other daughters born here and there. Maybe not. Maybe they were all boys. But the time frame is probably within 15 years. Now, that's, how, that's from four ladies. I was telling somebody today, my biological siblings, were, there's seven of us, my mom had them in one decade. In one decade, she had seven kids. <laughs> this is from four different women. And so you can imagine how it's going to start growing from here on out. <laughs> and so God has, has promised that they would become like the sands of the sea, the dust of the earth, and we begin to see it here. From here to the time at the end of Genesis when they are taken into, into Egypt, there will be at least 70 of them that's associated. So it's going to be, still be another hundred years, couple hundred years, but they will grow somewhat. Don't quote me on the hundreds of years. I got to look that up. But by the time we get to the end, at least a hundred years. When they leave, 400 years later, there will be at least 2 million of them. <laughs> That's how fast this population grows. 
And so let's finish off the rest of the chapter here, and we'll get into some worship. 25, verse 25. And it came to pass, when Rebekah had bore Joseph, that Jacob said to Laban, Send me away, that I may go to my own place and my own country. Give me my wives and my children, whom I have served you, for whom I have served you. And let me go, for I know my service which I have done for you. And Laban said to him, Please stay. If I have found favor in your, in your eyes, for I have, I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. Then he said, Name me your wages, and I will give it. So Jacob said to him, You know how I have served you and how your livestock has been with me. For what you have before you I came with was little. When I came it was little. And it has increased to a great amount. The Lord has blessed you since my coming. And now when shall I also provide for my own house? And he said, what shall I give you? And Jacob said, you shall give me nothing. For you, have done, for you will do this thing for me. If you do this for me, I will feed and keep your flock. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing them from your, removing there all the speckled and spotted sheep and all the brown ones among the lambs the, and the spotted and speckled among the goats. These shall be my wages. So my righteousness will answer for me in the time to come when the subject of my wages comes before you. Everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats, brown among the lambs, will be considered stolen if, they, if it is with me. And Laban said, Oh, that it would be according to your word. So he removed that day the male goats that were speckled and spotted, all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that had come white on it, that had some white on it, and all the brown ones among the lambs, and gave them into the hands of his sons. Then he put three days' journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flock. Now Jacob took for himself rods of green poplar and of almonds and chestnut trees, peeled white strips on them, in them, and exposed the, the white which was in the rods. And the rods which he had peeled, he set before the flocks in the gutters, in the water trough where the flocks were, came to drink, so that there should, they should conceive when they come to drink came to drink so the flock conceived before the rods and the flock brought forth streaked speckled and spotted and Jacob uh, separated the lambs and made the the flocks face towards the speckled and all the brown of the flock of Laban but he put his own flock by themselves and did not put them with Laban's flock and it came to pass, whenever the strong livestock conceived, that Jacob placed the rods before their eyes, the, the eyes of the livestock in the gutters, and that they might conceive among the rods. And when the flocks were feeble, he did not put them in. So the feeble were Laban's, and the stronger were Jacob's. Thus the men, thus the man became exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks female and male servants, and camels and donkeys. And so really quick, so we can get into some worship. I'm looking at the time here. So now he's saying, hey, I need to go and start my own family. And he's saying, no, 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 stay with me. Stay with me longer. Because I know that your God has blessed you a lot and I've prospered. <laughs> and so he says, no, no, no. He says, well, what's your wages? He says, I don't want anything from you. I'll take the, the, the lesser of all, all, the, all your stock. 
and that will be my wages, and you just go on with your bad self, and I'll keep all the, the lesser ones. And yet, Laban goes in there and steals all of those and takes those away, so he basically has nothing left, but he continues to work for him. And so what we have seen here is that what the Lord has done with Jacob is something amazing because he doesn't retaliate after he's been jacked so many times. That's not Jacob, but something happened to Jacob. God has changed Jacob. There's a humility about him, and maybe he's going, you know what, I deserve a lot of this because of the way I, I acted in the past. But now he's living a life in such a way that he knows, I will take the lesser of all of it, I will have nothing, and God will prosper me. And that's what we see at the end. Again, as I was reading about him doing these things with these, the peels of these trees, I'm going, okay, is there something to that? And most commentators said, no, it was just a superstitious thing back in the day that they, they thought, well, if you look at this, that that's what you're going to get. And it, it was not, not the case. So it was a superstitious kind of thing. Anyways, let's close in prayer so we can have some worship. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for our time together. We ask, God, that you would just bless our time of worship right now. Oh, Lord, I feel like I, I just hurried up at the end, Lord God, but I want to rest right now as we worship you, that God, you would minister to us and just speak to us. And thank you, Lord, for allowing us to, to read this portion of Scripture as we learned about the 12 tribes, Lord God, at least the 11 right now. But Lord, thank you, Lord, for how you work. Lord, regardless of the situation, we see your grace in all of this. And through it all, Lord, we see your grace and your mercies. And we thank you that you work with broken people, Lord, because that's who we are as well. And we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's, let's worship, guys. <laughs>